Hi everyone, good afternoon. Happy Thursday. Okay, um, this morning, the special representative for the Secretary General to Iraq, Janine hennis Blechert, briefed the Security Council on the situation in the country. She underlined the importance that political parties and other actors prioritize the country's interest above all, stressing that at the end of the day, it remains a joint responsibility. Um, the special representative also conveyed to the Security Council a sense of hope that the confirmation of Iraq's new government will provide an opportunity to structurally address the many pressing issues facing the country and its people, and a sense of urgency for Iraq's political class to seize the brief window of opportunity, and to finally lift the country out of recurring cycles of instability and fragility. Her full remarks were shared with you. Turning to Ethiopia, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that access in the north continues to improve, and we have expanded our operations in Afar, Amhara, and Tigray regions. But some pockets remain hard to reach. Since the cessation of hostilities agreement in mid-November, more than 127,000 tons of food have been brought into Tigray, reaching more than 3.8 million people. Meanwhile, our humanitarian colleagues note that fighting in parts of southern Amhara and neighboring areas of Oromia region have led to significant displacement in Amhara's North Shewa, South Wello, and West Gojem zones. Humanitarian partners are mobilizing food, shelter, and other relief to people in need. In the southern and eastern parts of Ethiopia, the historic drought that has gripped the wider Horn of Africa continues. We and our partners aim to reach 17 million people with food, water, health, and agriculture support, among other assistance. Our humanitarian colleagues also note that the cholera outbreak in parts of Oromia and Somali regions has seen more than 1,000 cases reported to date. Close to 1 million people are considered at high risk. An oral cholera vaccination campaign has been launched, and 33% of the people they intend to assist have been reached so far. Given the scale of the needs, additional funding is critical. Financial requirements for this year are being finalized and expected to remain high. Last year, the Ethiopia Humanitarian Appeal received less than half of the $3.3 billion that are required. Turning to Mali, today we and our humanitarian partners launched an appeal for $751 million to meet the urgent needs of 5.7 million people, over half of whom are women and children. The launch was hosted by the government of Mali and co-chaired by the UN humanitarian coordinator, Alain Nudehu. The appeal aims to mobilize the necessary funding for the humanitarian response plan 2023 for the country. As you know, Mali faces a multidimensional crisis fueled by insecurity, conflict, climate change, and lack of access to basic social services. As of December, over 400,000 people, mainly children and women, have been displaced due to increasing insecurity in the regions of Bandiag Bandiagara, Mopti, Gao, Timbuktu, Segu, and Manaka. Our colleagues say that humanitarian needs have increased by 17% compared to last year. And um, on to the Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed. As you know, she is visiting Vatican City and Rome today. At the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, she participated in the workshop on the fraternal economy of integral and sustainable development. She underscored the concepts of solidarity and equality and how that resonates with people of all faiths. She also highlighted ways to overcome current crises, working collectively to transform our societies and economies to enable and sustain the conditions for all life on earth to thrive. Other discussions centered on financial challenges facing developing countries, multinational businesses, and sustainable development. And in Rome, Ms. Mohammed also met with the UN Food Systems Coordination Hub to discuss the food system stock take moment and the sustainable development goals. And in Syria, the UN Refugee Agency and the UN Development Program today released their Regional Refugee and Resilience Plan for the country, which is seeking $5.7 billion to reach 6.8 million Syrian refugees and 6.1 million people affected, um, uh, people who are part of the host communities. Uh, furthermore, the plan will continue to support and complement the various host countries' ongoing efforts to address the needs of affected populations and strengthen public institutions to provide access to basic services. Uh, the agencies noted that Syria crisis will enter its 12th year this year, 
and it remains one of the largest refugee crises in the world. The needs are greater than ever. And I want to flag that today is World Wetlands Day. As you know, wetlands are ecosystems where water is the primary factor controlling the environment and the associated plant and animal life. And they're disappearing three times faster than forests. And the theme this year is revive and restore degraded wetlands. And it highlights the importance of restoring these lands. And that is it for me today. I will take your questions. Yes, Edie. Um, the military rulers in Myanmar declared martial law today um, in 37 townships across eight of the country's 14 regions and states. Does the Secretary General have any comment on this uh, further extension of the state of emergency? Um, I think you asked me a similar question yesterday, and our, our, he doesn't have any further comment. I think like his statement on the two mark of the military takeover still stands. Um, we continue to um, hope that the situation there um, leads to conditions where people can uh, live without fear of violence, where they're free to protest and uh, they have freedom of expression, and of course that elections can be held um, in, in conditions that are um, good for everyone and not where everyone is fearing for intim of intimidation. And a follow-up on um, Ethiopia and the North. Um, have UN staff on the ground seen any uh, indication that Eritrean troops are still in northern Ethiopia and Tigray. Uh, we'll, we will ask our humanitarian colleagues. I, we have no information on that for now. Um, Batul? Uh, as the anniversary of the war in Ukraine is nearing, I just wonder if the SG uh, plans to have any trips to maybe Ukraine, or does he have any any plans at all? Um, we have no travel plans to announce for now. Uh, is he going to be here to join any UN Security Council meeting or anything planned at the General Assembly? I think there is a General Assembly meeting scheduled, and he will be speaking um, there. Daji. A couple of questions on the uh, situation in uh, the Korean Peninsula. Uh, yesterday, SG met with the foreign minister of South Korea. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so so do you have any readout? We do not have a readout. Uh, so what 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 have what have uh, they discussed yesterday? I mean, I think. Listen, uh, I can tell you that. Some of the things that they discuss are the developments in the region, including the situation in the Korean Peninsula. They also discuss cooperation between the UN and the Republic of Korea. Um, you will have already seen reports that the Secretary General, you know, he expressed concern about um, the escalating tensions there, and you know, he he remains fully committed um, to helping the countries in the region achieve the goal of. Um, denuclearization. Um, and, you know, we firmly believe that diplomatic engagement uh, is the pathway to that. And, you know, he, he, he's expressed concern. He's expressed concern that um, an additional nuclear test from the DPRK um, would, would have very dramatic consequences in the region. Now, uh, Today, the foreign minister, uh, foreign ministry of uh, DPRK, also issued a statement. I believe you have already seen seen that. They said, and I quote: "U.S. is going to ignite an all-out showdown with DPRK through continued combined drills, whose scale and scope are largely extended." And and in in this statement, they also uh, quoted uh, the the the. the the, the Secretary of Defense of the U.S., uh, his remarks in, in Seoul said that U.S. will offer 
um, fifth generation fighter jets as well as other uh, strategic weapons. Um, you talked about diplomatic engagement. When, when we saw these kinds of rhetorics and also the drills, military drills and this tick for tack uh, a, a movement or operations, do you think there's still room for diplomatic engagement? And how, how would, how would you know, relative parties to, to have this diplomatic engagement? I mean, I think we not only think there is room for diplomatic engagement, but as we've previously said, diplomatic engagement remains the only pathway to sustainable peace and to the complete and verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So we will keep working on that. Yes, Kirsten. Thank you. Um, sorry, it was beeping there. I didn't know if it was working. Um, the investigations in Ukraine into corruption seem to be continuing. Um, I'm wondering if the UN uh, has been asked to look at anything, given the amount of aid that's going into the country. Does the UN have any um, information about the investigations that are taking place there, or any concerns um, that they'd like addressed? Um, what's the Secretary General's reaction to that, please? Thanks. I'm not. I'm not aware that we have any role. I mean, obviously, this is a an internal issue that Ukraine is dealing with, and you know we fully support any pursuit of transparency in any country. Or plans uh, does, from the Deputy Secretary General's office any update on the Women in Islam conference? Uh, we in do March? not, and I hope to. I hope to have something for you, but not today. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Um, Abdel Hamid, although I don't think we have the, I can't see you on screen, but maybe Abdel Hamid. Mm -hmm. oh, I am on the screen. I see myself on the screen. Can you hear me? We can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, thank you. My question is, Israel decided to uh, deduct $32 million uh, dollar from the money that's supposed to go to the PA. That I, do you think that qualifies as collective punishment? And if so, do you agree that collective punishment is a war crime or not? Thank you. Um, I didn't really hear the first part about the money, but we did get a question on collective punishment yesterday, and we start, stand firmly against it. We don't believe that punishment should be um, given a, a, to a blanket part of a population as a whole. Is it a war a crime or not? Is collective punishment a war a crime or not? I think um, I've answered the question already. Anything else? No. Thank you, everybody. Paulina. <laughs>